I'm Angie Kantz, and this is part one of Deep Dive into the Character Evolution of Daryl Dixon from The Walking Dead for post-show recaps. Today I'm going to talk about the cultural role that Daryl portrays, his primary conflict in the show, and some of the techniques that Norman Reedus uses to portray Daryl Dixon. I'm going to be jumping around a lot. There will be many, many spoilers, so please don't say that I didn't warn you. The Walking Dead is by far my favorite show on air right now. The reason why I love it is because I think it works on so many different levels to so many different audiences. You've got your epic zombie action scenes, you've got compelling plot developments, you've got lots of deeper symbols and themes going on, and more importantly, you've got these big, beautiful, sweeping character arcs. The characters really change from one season to the next, and you can see how the actions of one character significantly impacts the growth of another, until they start layering on top of each other almost like a symphony. So if you don't believe that there's that much going on in The Walking Dead, please let me convince you otherwise, and don't leave until the miracle happens. There's a reason for this popular meme. It is almost impossible to watch Daryl Dixon and not fall in love with him. As a chick, I need to realize that I'm powerless against this. I can't fight thousands of years of instinct and evolution. But it's not just women. Any man who says that he doesn't have a man crush on Daryl Dixon is lying. There's a beautiful sadness that haunts Daryl. He's fought his way through abuse and neglect and come back on the other side of it with strength, honor, and an unquestioning loyalty. This new world is forcing an emotionally dysfunctional man to learn to trust others and sustain meaningful relationships in order to survive. Because he's vulnerable like all of us, his pain is so raw at times he's unable to hide it, while at the same time he's the toughest, most loyal human being you'll ever meet. And both these sides of Daryl are in constant conflict with each other, which makes him seductively complicated. Considering how little airtime Daryl actually gets on the show, our moments with him reveal a lot. We don't even meet Daryl until episode 3. Who we do meet first is Daryl's brother. Like him or not, our first impression of Daryl comes from Merle. Merle behaves as if he's in this world entirely alone, and then no one else can be trusted. He beats up one of their own because he wants to be in charge, and Rick needs to handcuff him to the roof like an animal. He's aggressive, antagonistic, and racist. It's clear that Merle is an excellent fighter, but doesn't care what anyone thinks of him, and has a very weak moral compass, if any at all. Under attack from walkers, the group abandons Merle on the rooftop. There's a dichotomy of societal roles at play in Daryl's character. The series begins with Daryl representing all of the typical stereotypes of the low-income, poorly educated, southern white male. We see Daryl as the criminal deviant at odds with the other members of his group. These other group members represent the facets of a civilized society. Rick represents law and order. Dale represents moral intelligence, while T-Dog represents emotional intelligence, and Daryl is at odds with all of them. It's not until episode 3 that we first hear of Daryl. Around the campfire, the group is discussing how they should break the news about Merle to Daryl. Glenn suggests that it should be a white guy who tells him, which lets us know that Daryl holds the same racial prejudices as Merle. Then Dale says something very important. Now remember that Dale comes to represent their humanity, the virtues of a civilized society. And that's what we tell Daryl. I don't see a rational discussion to be had from that, do you? In other words, Daryl might as well be an animal. T-Dog believes that all life has value, that all men are equal, and that doing the just thing is the only thing that matters. He knows it's his fault that Merle was left on the roof. Why you? You wouldn't even begin to understand. You don't speak my language. Again, it's as if they see him as a completely different species from them. This is important because it lays the groundwork for Daryl's primary conflict, that between the man he was before as a result of circumstances opposed upon him and the man he wants to be by nature, the wild thing versus the civilized man. Son of a bitch. Seasburn, motherless, proxy bastard. You take that stupid hat and go back to Uncle Mahan. You got something you want to tell me? I'm gonna kick your nuts up in your throat! I'm gonna stomp your ass! Wow! Sure. The 
budding bromance between Rick and Daryl starts in Daryl's very first episode, when Rick is the only one treating Daryl with respect. I'd like to have a calm discussion on this topic. You think we can manage that? You think we can manage that? This mirrors what Dale said Daryl couldn't do. Going back for Merle is the first olive branch that gets extended to Daryl. Later in Atlanta, when Daryl wants to go after Merle alone, Rick speaks to him man to man as equals. You can see Daryl is almost confused by Rick's approach. Stop me. I don't blame you. He's family. I get that. I went through hell to find mine. I know exactly how you feel. You can't get far with that injury. We could help each other a few blocks around, but only if we keep a level head. Do that. Daryl confirming that he can keep a level head flies in the face of what Dale said about him. Rick is starting to see that the group has misjudged Daryl, and we can see that Daryl is slowly starting to process the fact that these people are willing to help him. Shane never stops seeing Daryl as a wild animal, and we see him trying to pull Rick back from treating Daryl as an equal. Shane and Daryl have a very competitive relationship with each other, and we see that Shane is always trying to convince Rick that Daryl isn't worthy of them. He maintains his role as a cop, and treats Daryl like a redneck criminal. There's a slow transition in the relationships of these four men in the show, Rick and Shane, and Daryl and Merle. Slowly, we see Daryl become the best friend Shane never was, and Rick become the brother Merle never was. In Daryl's first episode, with an earshot of Daryl, Shane asks Rick why he would risk his life for a douchebag like Merle. Rick very articulately explains that he feels responsible for how Merle was left to die, and it doesn't matter what kind of man he is, no one should die like that. This plants a seed of respect in Daryl for how Rick sees beyond social stereotypes. So Rick decides to go back to Atlanta to look for Merle. And that's when Lori is all like. So you and Daryl, that's your big plan? I love that plan. Don't you have some silent scorn to be doing? So this is the birth of the long and beautiful friendship we see grow over time between Rick and Daryl. Slowly but surely, Rick realizes that Daryl is there for him, backing him, standing up for him, standing in for him, never doubting, never faltering. Let's talk about Daryl's mannerisms a little bit, and what they mean. When Daryl feels threatened, he paces like a caged animal. He swipes at people with his arm, like a feral cat defending his space. His face becomes vulnerable, like a scared little boy, and he paces, bracing for a fight. He's used to being alone, not being able to rely on anyone for anything, and this comes through when he paces. We first see this when the group tells him that Merle got left handcuffed to a building. He paces again on the rooftop. When he finds out he's trapped at the CDC, he has a temper tantrum and tries to chop through the door. In the ring in Woodbury, he is a little boy trapped in a cage, alone and scared, a wild animal caught in a trap. Daryl as the wild animal, terrified of being contained, is enforced the first night in the prison. Now keys on some guards. Daryl has a set to. I ain't sleeping in no cage. I'll take the perch. Unlike a wild animal, when Daryl is hurt, he lashes out at the people around him. When Daryl experiences loss, he reverts back into an angry, childlike, wild state. He has difficulty trusting the people in his life, since so many of the people who were supposed to care for him did not, and it feels safer for him to isolate and be alone when he's hurt. On the rooftop, after discovering his brother's severed hand, his first instinct is to point the crossbow at T-Dog. T-Dog stands like a statue, understanding exactly why Daryl is doing what he's doing. This is an excellent way to earn Daryl's respect. Go ahead. Carol absorbs his abuse, even when he scares her and wounds her like her late husband used to. Why you just keep an eye on her? Beth calls him on his crap. That's the best way to deal with Daryl. It's bullshit! 
that what you think? That's what I know. After the anger passes, he usually breaks down. Norman Reedus uses various techniques in his portrayal of Daryl Dixon. One of these techniques is his use of facial twitching, lip biting, and finger nibbling to communicate the character's emotional discomfort. Daryl's blinky face shows up when people force him to feel stuff. Most often it happens when others show emotional vulnerability in front of him. He doesn't know how to process it. He understands pain, but he doesn't understand sharing it with others. It makes him defensive and uncomfortable. After the attack on the camp, Daryl wants to burn the deceased members of the group, and Glenn, who acts completely from a place of emotion, lashes out at him. We don't burn them! We bury them. Understand? It's like he's trying to educate Daryl on how human beings behave. Because it's all about acknowledging emotions for Daryl, which is his least favorite thing to do, Twitchy Face is often followed by some sort of outburst. Read what you saw! No, shut up, man! Y'all left my brother for dead! You had this coming! When he thinks about what the group means to him, he bites his lip or chews his fingers. When the group discusses going to the CDC, he bites his lips. They're talking about a cure rather than just surviving. This is an evolved state for him, thinking about the future and being part of a group. When he gives Carol the Cherokee Rose for Sophia, he's also biting his lip. He doesn't know how to express tenderness, and it makes him uncomfortable. When he sees the Sophie handprint in the daycare, he thinks about the other little girl he couldn't save. When Carol is found after being lost in the tombs, he stands, biting his lip, relieved that she's okay. When Beth sings to him in the funeral home, he wonders if this is enough for him, if this beautiful, sweet girl is something he will be able to hang on to. So I hope you like the deep dive into the character of Daryl Dixon. Be sure to watch part two where I talk about Daryl's growth into the persona of Prison Daryl. Please let me know your questions and comments right here, and don't forget to subscribe and follow me on Twitter. Until next time, don't look back.